Hi, I'm Dr. Rudy Cashman, neurosurgeon, neurologist, Fort Wayne, Indiana, for 41 years. But I'm only 39 years old. <laughs> no, I consider myself really to be a wellness doctor. You can call me Dr. Wellness. I own a wellness uh, center uh, at Lutheran Hospital. I probably have 15 DVDs I've done, CDs now, and about 10 books, all about wellness. I'm trying to get you to live to be 100 years old. But to do that, I want you to have a sound mind. That's the reason uh, I had a DVD done recently uh, on memory. And today we're going to dwell quite a bit more uh, into dementia, memory loss, discuss Alzheimer's disease, and frankly, I have good news for you because my research has indicated that maybe Alzheimer's disease is really not a disease. That is, something has been promoted on you, then in reality, it represents uh, an extension of dementia, age-related memory loss, which we all get, some years more than others. So in some ways, this is wonderful news. In I'm going to present you the data and my reasoning behind this, as I think it's very important. Our elderly population is going to easily double in the next uh, 10 years. Uh, and if we keep on housing people with dementia and Alzheimer's disease, which I think is a fictitious diagnosis, but I'm not the only one who's thinking that. I found a very uh, excellent book. I think uh, God sort of threw it at me. Uh, at Barnes and Noble, and at the myth of Alzheimer's disease, you can read the book. It's written by Dr. Peter Whitehouse, a neurologist and researcher at Case Western uh, in Cleveland. Thirty years he's been working in this. He did the original research on two of the five main medications that are used uh, for dementia today. You know what he says? Drugs don't work. They don't work. So I'm going to make my case here, but I'm backed up by excellent book, which I've read three times. I'm disappointed. Very few people have ever read it. I'm disappointed. A lot of the neurologists I know have not read it. But I think it's very critical. If you don't agree with it, at least read it and take them up on it. And, but I'm here tonight to say that I'm uh, largely in agreement with what he says. I think it's very important to our lives. So let's begin this uh, talk tonight, the fraud of Alzheimer's disease. He calls it the myth, but I'm willing to go a step further, at least to get people to debate it, pay it some attention to it, and take me on about it. Take, take Dr. Whitehouse on about it, uh, because it has important significance. So let's kind of begin this uh, discussion tonight, uh, and, and I'll, I will uh, present my case. The fraud of Alzheimer's disease what we all fear, losing our mind. Who wants to get older and 80 years old and you can't remember anything? We don't want that. So we can discuss tonight how to prevent it, uh, for example. So memory loss, is it normal? Yes, a certain amount of memory loss is normal. But frankly, for most of us, it's not that much. We have something called age-associated memory impairment, AAMI. We all get it starting age 30 or 40 to some extent. But for most of it, it's very mild. A step up, suppose it gets a great deal worse. You have bad habits. You drink a lot of alcohol and things uh, of, of uh, uh, that nature. And you develop what's called MCI, mild cognitive impairment. MCI, mild cognitive impairment. And the step after that uh, would be dementia or severe dementia, which some people would call Alzheimer's disease. I don't... Uh, wish to call it Alzheimer's disease, and I'll give you my uh, uh, reasoning. How does memory work? Let's talk about the physiology a little bit here. Where is the memory located uh, in the brain? Recent memory, memory that we use uh, every day, is located in the temporal lobe. It's located in the temporal lobe. Long-term memory is really scattered throughout the brain, scattered throughout the brain. Where is memory really located? It's located in little vesicles, little carriers uh, that uh, at the synapse level, and I'll explain to you what a synapse is in a minute. R frankly, it's about molecules and neurotransmitters. It's about molecules and neurotransmitters. The uh, Revealing the myth of Alzheimer's disease, 
is a hundred-year-old monster has risen. This is really what we're talking about. It's cultural attempt to make a disease of a natural process of brain aging. That's what Dr. Whitehouse believes. That's what I believe. No two dementia cases are the same. That's what's very uh, uh, interesting. There's no one biological profile of Alzheimer's disease is consistent from person to person. They're all different. Every case is different. So how can you call it a disease? There are no clear pathological findings or on autopsy that identifies Alzheimer's disease for sure. You can do an autopsy on people 100 years old. You're going to find amyloid bodies, neurofibrillary tangles, uh, a, a normal to find even a normal person who has no memory loss whatsoever. Then you have another person that has tremendous memory loss. You call them Alzheimer's dementia and find out they have no pathological findings at all. So it, it's not a disease that can be confirmed by pathological findings for sure. Your blood sugar is 800, you're a diabetic. But you have amyloid bodies, neurofibrillary tangles, is not certain that you have Alzheimer's disease. So some of the pathological findings are the same in normal people. It was proven on a nun study. Uh, all the biological markers of Alzheimer's disease are also the hallmarks of, no of normal aging. So it's not a distinct entity. Let's continue in the fraud of Alzheimer's disease. Newspapers, major TVs, famous actors, they promote the myth. They promote it. And they scare us with it. We don't even know how to diagnose it. Not even autopsies can confirm it. So there's a false promise out there that science will win the war against the disease. The pharmaceutical industry has taken over. Dr. Whitehouse says the drugs don't work. Maybe there has a little bit of placebo effect. You feel better. They feel a little better for a few months and the deterioration uh, continues in advanced dementia. I don't deny that patients exist. What I'm saying is it's a normal process of aging, which in some people is a lot worse than others. So what's the difference? I'll tell you what the difference will be. So there's little scientific progress in 30 years, uh, although we have spent a lot of money. You cannot separate Alzheimer's disease from normal processes. So how can you treat it? How can we treat it or even study it? Scientists in the field admit the cure is unlikely, even today. They'll admit that. We don't know for sure what really is doing it. Some think the amyloid bodies and the neurofibrillary tangles are a reparative process on the brain. They're not really the cause of the disease. So it's a very powerful cultural myth. It's like the war. The pharmaceutical and industrial complex is at work. These huge organizations, they collect money, they pay themselves nice salaries, and they have meetings, and they raise money, and they get paid for their research. But yet, nothing for the work. Very little for the work. Almost no progress. The research and the industrial complex at work, the fundraising societies at work, fundraisers without results. Much profit to be gained by everyone, including nursing homes. I talked to my former nurse recently. At, he came to visit me, as a matter of fact, on Friday uh, from Indianapolis, moved out there, and a real beloved nurse, Brian, I had, and he was saying he's working in a nursing home now, and he's telling me uh, about uh, nursing room one, uh, unit one, unit two, unit three. It's like a gulag. He says to take people with a little bit of memory loss, and the family dumps them into nursing home one. They stay a little bit. They ignore them. Uh, they become depressed. They get a bit worse. They go to nursing home number two, all Alzheimer's uses. We're just causing these people to live into the role. We are creating these people, and we tell them, you have memory loss, it's, ac it's, it's accentuated, uh, we can't take care of you, uh, uh, you're losing your job, uh, and we can't afford to take care of you, and now they move you over into the nursing home, Gulag 1, 2, and 3. We need to change the way we look at these things. Foreign countries, Okinawa, different countries, Sardinia, they treat the elderly a lot differently. They love them, they hug them, they fight for who's going to take care of the 100-year-old person. In this country, we dump them away. This is, has to stop. It, it's, it's not correct for the person. We're destroying the individual. Uh, we're causing him to live into the role. Uh, and uh, I've read Dr. Whitehouse's book three times now. I've not found one of my neurologists ever read the book. Not a one of them. And uh, 25 years in the Alzheimer's dementia field, Dr. Whitehouse was. He's an expert. He did the research. He helped set out the criteria for research and diagnosis, Dr. Whitehouse did. He says the drugs essentially don't work, a lot of money wasted, false hope. He noticed shift from caring potential to people 
to medicines that don't work. They go to a nursing home, they're all on these uh, uh, medications. Uh, they don't work, cost an awful lot of money. Everybody's making some money. The drug company's making money. The nursing home is making money. And the patient uh, and the, uh, uh, the government and insurance companies are paying the bill. It's not fair. It's not, fa not fair to the patient. It's full of false hope. And, uh, so, and Dr. Whitehouse noticed a shift from caring potential uh, uh, to medicines that don't work. Many times uh, pills are given and the patients are locked up. Dr. Whitehouse says it's inhumane and inexcusable, and I agree. Dr. Whitehouse spent his professional life uh, in the social, political, economic, and social institutions dealing with Alzheimer's disease. He's an expert. I've had many of his associates agree. I've spoken to a psychiatrist at a recent meeting I was in Boston, and they agree. One of my PhDs in my group, 20 years working with dementia, told me after reading the book, I gave it to him, and he said he wished he had written it himself. Very interesting. So now he spends his time challenging Alzheimer's community that are great power over us. He's pessimistic about the future of care for dementia patients, and it needs to be redefined. We need to redefine how we look at them. Aging is not a disease. It's a normal process. It's part of life. It's part of life. It's a normal process. The scientific, technological, and political approach to this war needs to be revisited. We should maximize prevention and quality of life issues. A lot of things can be done. We start having memory loss. Uh, we can increase activities. We can encourage them to read. Uh, we can teach them to do sports activities. I'll go through these things we can do. And there are many things we can do to help turn the situation around. Uh, the tragedy of aging versus memory loss is unique. It's not a disease process. We need to break free from the mindset that memory loss is some sort of disease that someone gets. There's a better framework. We need to change the framework. The doctor or the MIF, what does he order? Invasive tests, PET scans, CTs, MRIs, and spec scans, cognitive testing. You take a memory test, you're missing a few words. Ah, you have dementia. And what was going to happen to me, Dr. Well, you may get Alzheimer's d disease. Have a nice day. What are you going to do? Get depressed and start living the role. Now, now take some medications. They, they do little and don't cure anybody. Now let's talk about the patient of the myth. He has fear of memory loss. He has fear of loss of function, fear of loss of job, uh, fear of living alone, becomes depressed, useless. Some even commit suicide because they were told the story of dementia. You may get Alzheimer's disease down the line. A lot of them get placed in nursing homes because of minor problems. Uh, because nobody wants to take care of them or help them or love them. Uh, and then they move on from unit one to three, the, the gulag, the gulag of dementia. The hope, uh, start a positive scenario. Let's tell a different story. Let's de-emphasize the disease story. Set a plan of action. Let's say, uh, look at our website, for example. Uh, we now have a very great uh, uh, website, uh, uh, Cashman Mind Body. You hit the brain and it uh, comes up, a website pops up in which I have uh, probably enough to keep you busy for six months uh, to sharpen your brain. Great, uh, great sites. Uh, set a plan of action. That's a plan of action. Look at his website. Let, let's, let's go to the library. Let's start exercising. Uh, so memory challenges, we may all have them. Promote a community caregiving for elderly patients uh, and not to the nursing home. So which scenarios are we going to follow? Essentially the same recommendations uh, as I have on my Longevity mind by the index, just like I, on my uh, left to your right, I, I have uh, the uh, mind body index, which I list uh, about 25 of the illnesses caused by stress. Uh, I now have formed the longevity mind body index, uh, which I list the 25 things or so you could do to sharpen your brain. To sharpen your brain. And we'll review those, we'll review those uh, one by one. So at the moment, science, there's a, there's a fairly large waste of resources. Uh, I say limit the resources a bit, but continue the research. Take 50% of the money to teach prevention and caregiving and continue the research. I'm not against research, but we shouldn't spend 90% uh, of the money on, on uh, research, which in 30 years has done nothing, nothing, for a disease that I, Dr. Whitehouse, really don't even think exists. We think it's a natural process of aging, and you're never going to change it. You can improve it, uh, but you're not going to eliminate it with some, some drug. So there will not be a magic bullet. Uh, don't put cure before prevention. 
Prevention should be number one, just like the rest of medicine we practice today. You know, we try to cure it with angioplasties uh, uh, and, and, and back surgeries when prevention should be number one. It's not number one in this country. Uh, that, that's way down the line. Prevention is the healthiest, the cheapest, has the least complications. So teach methods of neuroplasticity. What's neuroplasticity? Your brain has the ability to learn and change and improve itself over time. That's been proven through learning techniques, uh, through uh, proper uh, diets, through stress reduction, through exercise. We can grow brain cells. We can increase neurotransmitters. Your memory is a neurotransmitter. We'll talk more about that. But that's where your memory is lo uh, located. So teach methods of neuroplasticity. Promote community involvement, especially the family. Let's pick a better name. I'm looking for a better name. Email it to me. Send it to me. Let's not call it dem uh, dementia or Alzheimer's disease. That, that's too scary. You know, in Japan, they did something about it. Uh, they changed the name. They picked a, 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 a more friendly name that people can accept. But here you say dementia or Alzheimer's disease, you think your life is over. It's the end. I'm useless. I'm good to nobody. I'm living in a nursing home. I'm a, a terrible, depressing scenario. Uh, let's tell a more truthful story. A good story is essential to any sense of self-worth. If you speak a different language, we'll tell a different story. We'll start acting better. Remember, I wrote a book on uh, the nocebo, the evil twin. How negative speak gets people to live in the role. How placebo effect, a positive story, people uh, react uh, to that. You can respond to the story positively or negatively. I say pick a positive story. It's a hopeful story. So let's look at this with integrity and dignity, personhood, quality of life, a sense of community for future generations. And uh, let's have a huge push for prevention. Let's have a huge push for prevention. Look at my mind, body, uh, memory, memory, body uh, index. A lot of things in there for you could do. And here you see the index, the longevity, uh, mind, body uh, index uh, right here. And here I have listed uh, about 20 things that you can do to improve uh, your longevity. Uh, and, and if you have uh, bad habits, you know, you lose your memory at a young age. You have good habits, uh, you live to be 100 and of sound mind. And, uh, and number one, uh, in terms of habits, what you eat. Number one determines type 2 diabetics, eat a, eating a fatty diet and that glycerides up, have poor memories. Uh, so what you eat is extremely important. And we'll uh, go into that some more. So promote family, community involvement. Stop looking, stop locking everyone up. Many could live at home. No one has Alzheimer's disease. It's a label. It's a label. No one can prove the disease that you got it. It's a label they put on you imprecise and socially harmful. We need aging with dignity. Let's find a better term. Please email me, give me some ideas. Alzheimer's disease diagnosis does not need to enter your household, your choice. Uh, uh, it is your choice, what you, ha what you call it. If there's memory loss in your mother or father or something, uh, treat them lovingly and, and, and help them in their situation. And don't put nasty labels on them. And, uh, and I'll tell you a story of uh, my mother and her two sisters uh, uh, later on. That you'll find that very interesting. So the Alzheimer's disease myth is powerful. A Socrates story, a good, good example. Socrates was at, the, was at the gate of Athens and a, a gentleman went to enter the city. And uh, he said, uh, what kind of a city do you have here? And, and, uh, and Socrates uh, said, well, what was your city like? In my city, oh, we had crime, we had robberies. Uh, it was a terrible place to live. Uh, and, and Socrates said, well, you know, our city is like that. Why didn't you go back home? The next guy came. Again, Socrates, uh, the guy said, what kind of city do you have here? I'd like to move to, to, to Athens. And, uh, and Socrates said, what kind of city were you living in? Oh, it's economically successful, very friendly, loving. Uh, it's a, a great place to live. And, and Socrates says, uh, uh, why don't you uh, enter Athens? Because our place is like that. You see the point? One, it's your perception. It's how you perceive things around you. That's the point. Uh, Buddhism, Eastern and Western concepts are totally different. Uh, Asian countries uh, treat the elderly respect. Uh, they, uh, if you're 110 years old, uh, they fight for who's going to take care or live with that person. That's not the way it's in Western society. Here, almost guaranteed to be in a nursing home if you have any kind of a little problem at all. We need, we need to change. Uh, so if you're visualizing a pure future, it brings it on. That's the, no, that's the nocebo effect. And... Uh, so the nocebo effect of words, the negative speak, watch out. You will live into the role. It's your choice, perception. The standard myth is too negative. And we have the medicalization of dementia, nursing home, medications, negativity. 
brain aging is not a war. Don't create non-persons. You have memory loss and, and, and some are a little more advanced than others. Don't make them a non-person. Make them a loving person in your family. Life is like a flame. It, this is the Buddhist philosophy. In the end, it's going to burn out. In the end, it's going to burn out. Uh, but let's, it's, the, it's the power of choice. Love, not fear or anger. Quality time. It's a time we can hold hands and music and take walks and friends. Life changes. But here's an opportunity to, for a family member to become closer. I remember my mother, as she was aging, uh, we became a lot closer uh, as she developed uh, uh, some memory loss uh, later in her uh, 80s. The whole family became much more closer. We never, never mentioned she had memory loss, dementia, Alzheimer's disease. Only one of my kids brought it up once. Nobody ever mentioned it. We treated her lovingly. We, we hugged her, uh, and uh, in 97, she died uh, of me at the bedside uh, playing uh, the music of Andy Rue, uh, the wonderful uh, uh, European German music that she loved, uh, and she never knew what happened. And a uh, very interesting story, how to treat somebody uh, differently. Love triumphs over myth. Plato said, limit the doctor's power over us. Negative talk can overpower us, cause us to have things done we don't need done. So the biomedical view is too strong, exposing ourselves to the tyranny above us. Clearly, it can be a struggle for the caregiver. No doubt about it. I don't deny that. I don't deny the severe dementia exists. And some may need to be institutionalized, but not the majority. Not the majority. So a positive viewpoint is, is helpful. We are more than the cognitive sum uh, of our memories. There's no loss in, in, in self only change in self. Rewrite the story and reduce it to its bare bones. That's like Descartes is described in, in 1650. See, Rewrite the story and reduce it to its bare bones like Descartes did in 1650. Descartes uh, was a mathematician, a philosopher, historian, uh, who separated the brain from the human body, gave it to the church. The body went to medicine. And for 300 years, uh, we've been dissecting the body, relating to disease, and totally forgot this is attached to the human body. 75% of the people that I see in my practice have a physical presentation of stress caused by this guy. So that was a major error. But Descartes did have another, famous, uh, published a very famous book. And what he, in essence, did is reduce the story, it was reductionist reasoning, it was called, to reduce the story to its bare bones. That was to take out opinions and all peripheral things, but look at the bare, at the bare uh, facts. But so when you look at the bare facts of Alzheimer's disease, you get very little. I mean, we get almost nothing. You get memory loss. You don't even know why they got it. You can't prove it pathologically. Uh, so uh, his thought process, I think, is quite important here. So cognitive loss is part of humanity, not a disease. We all lose some over a period of time. That's normal. Some more than others. Depends a lot on their diseases they have. For example, type 2 diabetes is more common. And a lot of the habits, high blood pressure, a lot of things uh, determine that. Whether they drink too much, have toxic habits, all these things affect it. Uh, it's very interesting. When Dr. Whitehouse was on the Oprah show, when he was on the Oprah show, uh, she asked Dr. Whitehouse three times, where's the beef? Dr. Whitehouse remarked on that. She didn't see the beef. And Oprah, I love you for that. You, you figure it out too. Where's the beef? She wondered, what, the, what is this thing called Alzheimer's disease? She was never sure. Very interesting. The Michael Fox story, he was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's patients in the late stages can have a lot of memory loss. Uh, but instead of living into the story, uh, Michael Fox made a new life out of it and carried uh, with the ball and is having a great life. He looked at it totally differently. He didn't follow that negative scenario. Uh, Michael Fox, we respect you for that. So brain aging cannot be cured. Choose your story. Choose your story. And uh, the flame will go out for all of us. We'll go down the spirit of love and celebrate life. Let's talk about it a little bit. I think I brought my point home here. And uh, in, in, uh, what, what, what is Dr. Whitehouse and I trying to say? Let's avoid uh, t uh, being so negative to people who have some memory loss and getting them to live into the role of dementia. Start isolating them, not loving them, putting them in nursing homes, 
and before you know it, they're in the Alzheimer unit. Let's instead follow a preventive scenario. Let prevention be number one. And then if things happen to get a little worse, to treat them more lovingly and keep them at home as long as we possibly can, and they'll do, they'll do a lot better. And, and prevention should be a big thing. You can see that on my website. And uh, what is memory? Is using our five senses to gather information. That's really memory. And then storing it and then be able to retrieve it. That's, that's memory. Where is the memory located? It's located in little vesicles like ping pong balls, of course, extremely extremely small, microscopic. They've been demonstrated on the electron microscope and get magnified 10,000 times. And, you, and each little carrier has in it about 5,000 5, molecules. That is your memory. That is your memory. So our memory is our intelligence, our personality, our humanity. It's us. It's our currency. Memory is your currency. It's our primary resource. What is it really all about? For our brain cells and synapses. Synapses uh, are little spaces uh, between the axons and dendrites uh, in nerve conduction. I'll show you a picture of it shortly. So uh, to, to uh, stay sharp, fire it, wire it, use it or lose it. Extremely important. How to prevent uh, memory loss. Short-term memory, where is that located? Mainly in the hippocampus of your temporal lobe. Short-term memory now has been redefined into immediate memory. Immediate memory is me walking down the hall and say, hi, Jane, how are you doing? In 10 seconds, I totally forget the event, okay? That's, that's, that's uh, immediate memory. But then we have working memory, which is part uh, of, recent, of short-term memory, uh, but that's how we do activities around us, how to run this computer, give the show. That, that's uh, uh, working memory. It lasts with us longer. Uh, now, to convert working memory into long-term memory, how does that happen? By attaching an emotion to it, by repeating it a number of times, and during sleep. That's why a good night's sleep is part of my longevity mind-body index, because we take a lot of our, sh our sh immediate and working memories that occur in the daytime and convert them to long-term memory while we are asleep. That's why sleep is very important. And uh, so if working memory is processed and rehearsed, processed and rehearsed, repeat it, use it, put an emotion to it, it converts to long-term memory. Emotions are a good way uh, to make, turn things into long-term memory. So is visualization. You visualize something with an emotion, you're much more likely going to remember. Now here, I'd like you to look at this here. This is very interesting, memory types. Here is a uh, demonstration, right here you see is an axon. Uh, that is... Uh, in a nerve cell sends a message to the next nerve cell. See these little red things right here? That's your memory. These are vesicles, these carriers I was talking about that have 5,000 molecules in each little carrier. Uh, and these go through a little gate right here across the synapse, that's the space, through the next gate and now the end of the dendrite and the message is sent along. Your memory is determined by how many of the synapses that you have. That's it right there. You want to improve your memory, improve your synapses. That is why education is quite helpful. College education, much more likely to get, less likely to get dementia. Same with continued education as you get older, or reading, or doing Sudoku, or doing puzzles. Uh, this imp increases the number of your synapses, uh, and uh, your memory improves. Let's talk about memory. Let's talk about long-term declarative memory and non-declarative memory. Non-declarative memory is like me playing tennis. I don't have to think when I play it. I play it for so many years. So that's an undeclarative memory. Long-term, a declarative memory is things like remembering your uh, graduation from college or a wedding or a Thanksgiving dinner. That's long-term declarative uh, uh, memory. I was playing tennis with Dr. Crawford recently, and he was just hitting the lines right and left. So he was playing really an undeclarative memory. I tried to convert him to, to think. And, and turn them to a declarative memory. So I stopped playing serving volley, going in the net. Now we had to think. And all of a sudden, the game went down a little bit because there's a thought process. People do a lot better to stay in undeclarative, don't think. Of a playing, playing golf, for example, if you don't think, you hit a ball a lot better. Once you start thinking, uh, a process, and then uh, things go down. So that's a good distinguishing factor. And uh, so long-term memory uh, and uh, declarative memory is also, called, is also called explicit memory. So memory is in your molecules. I think I demonstrated. Here's an example. Again, uh, here, right here is an axon that sends a message to the next uh, nerve cell synapse right here. There's an example of a synapse right here. Uh, and this is the nucleus of the cell uh, which carries uh, your uh, DNA. Secret of enhancing your brain. Let's talk about that a little bit here. There are about 100 billion brain cells. You have about 100 billion cells. Would you 
can you believe it? 100 billion cells? But what about synapses? Remember your memories and your synapses? You got 100 trillion of them. 100 trillion of them. You can increase them or decrease them. Drink a lot of alcohol, you're going to decrease them. Uh, you're going to uh, do a lot of cognitive activities, uh, you're going to increase them. There's more synapses in your brain than stars in the universe. How about that? You lose about 10 to 15% of your brain cells by age 65. So you see, that's not a lot. That's not a lot, unless you get bad habits. You can sure as heck increase it by toxic habits. About 1% have advanced dementia by age 65, so that's not really a very, very large uh, number. Uh, what's neuroplasticity? We talked about that a little earlier, but I'd like to show you in more detail. The ability of the brain to grow and learn. The ability of your brain to grow and learn, which can occur throughout your life. Throughout your life. That's neuroplasticity. It's been recently discovered. See, people used to think you only lose brain cells, you can't increase them. Wrong. Totally wrong. By eating the right food, exercising, uh, stress reduction techniques, uh, uh, computer techniques, uh, puzzles, etc., you can increase your brain cells. Uh, so, uh, so the brain is highly dynamic and constantly reorganizing itself at any, a at any age. So you have neurogenesis, more nerve cells, neuroplasticity, you, uh, learning in, improves the number of brain cells and, and the increases the rate of conductivity, make them work better. So neuroplasticity is a lifelong capacity of the brain to change, and the ability to revive itself in response to a stimulus of learning and experience. Let me read it once more. Neuroplasticity is a lifelong capacity of the brain to change and the ability to revive itself in response to a stimulus of learning and experience. Very interesting and great hope for all of us. The World Brain Gym. Let's look at this uh, uh, illustration a minute here. Again, here comes the axon. It's going to the synapse, but you see the stuff is in the way. That's the amyloid we talked about before. We get that from head injuries. We get it from getting a day older. And, and, the, and the Alzheimer's theory is this is the cause of Alzheimer's disease. The only darn trouble is it's found in normal people who have no trouble at all. So they're not sure that's the cause of it by a long shot. Inflammatory cells can come along uh, and it, it also make the amyloid even more sticky. Inflammatory cells are produced by fat. If you have a lot of fat in your blood, you're more likely to have inflammatory cells. So uh, to improve yourself, so use every day as an opportunity to grow your brain. Best thing you do, get on the computer a half hour a day and, and like on my website and play the, like the Pogo website. They have all types of games and boards and everything. Play it for a half hour. Uh, video games, they, they do improve your brain, not eight hours a day. I'm talking about 30 minutes, an hour. Your intelligence will improve. So, but vary your cognitive workout routine, all types of activities, reading, uh, exercise, piano playing, uh, whatever, art, gardening, reading, music, new hobby, take music lessons, very important. Let's talk about the aging brain a little bit more. Uh, brain cell loss doubles every five years after age 65, but remember the loss is not that high. And uh, so there is some memory loss uh, with the aging brain. And we talked about already about age-associated memory loss, uh, which is memory loss uh, uh, that we all get a little bit of. And they talk about the mild cognitive impairment where it gets a little bit worse. Then they're even sure about that diagnosis. And then we talked about uh, dementia. Uh, and some people get an advanced dementia. If you get bad habits, you're likely to get it. Occasionally, there's some familial genetic cases. But also those are exaggerated to some extent because people who don't have the gene, the family start thinking they got it, and they start living in the role that makes themselves worse. There's a recently bit article in the New York Times, there were barely a week ago, where a family in Peru was doing this. Uh, ones who didn't have it were thinking they had it, start acting into the role. And uh, the secret of enhancing your brain, 90% of the people who think they have dementia don't have it. These are neurotransmitters. You see very few neurotransmitters here. So this is a case of advanced uh, dementia. Depression is a big problem. A lot of people who think they have memory loss are depressed. And uh, they alone with uh, maybe taking a walk for an hour every day, this sort of thing. And remember, a walk, it can be as good as taking a, some medication. Um, some people need to take medication in advanced cases. But depression can be a big problem. Uh, and we already spoke about the mythology of, of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we can get people to live into the role by a by little, little bit of memory loss. We say, oh, well, you got dementia and you could get Alzheimer's disease. And you start living into the role. The family treats you like we, the job place treats you like that. They start giving you medication. You start getting depressed. And depression can get worse. And some people commit suicide because they think they're going to go to a nursing home, be useless, and, and get Alzheimer's disease. In reality, all they got is a little depression. You got to watch out for that. Uh, that's not uncommon. Uh, 
Uh, let me tell you a story of the three sisters. Uh, my, my mother, uh, my, my, one of my mother's sisters, uh, traveled a lot, read a lot, played games a lot, did puzzles every day, died at age 95 with a perfectly normal brain. She had another sister uh, who was uh, married to an alcoholic husband in Germany, and uh, he died of uh, liver disease, and she became depressed. They told her she had dementia. Then she became a bit more de de depressed, and they started tell telling her she had Alzheimer's disease. She had none of those. I talked to her. I did, I did not believe it. But in Germany, that's where Dr. Alzheimer's from. They use that diagnosis quite a bit, and they get her playing in the role. She got upset with the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. You know, she lived thousands of miles away from me, so I didn't really couldn't affect her very much. She committed suicide. She committed suicide. Let's talk about my mother a minute. My mother really only planned life was for me to be a doctor. She sure got that done. She told me that the day I was born, and you know, I remember that. <laughs> okay, and uh, uh, but. Uh, uh, my father, uh, uh, they did not do a lot of cognitive activities. They, they didn't read books. My dad read the newspaper. She didn't read the newspaper. She didn't play cards. Uh, she really was not active mentally uh, uh, that much. And she started developing some memory loss after my uh, father and I, maybe in the late 80s or so, and I didn't make a big deal of it. Uh, somebody might even say she had Alzheimer's disease. That could, have been, that could have been said. I didn't make a big deal of it. I brought her all the family events. We took her to dinner. We, we just never made a big deal of it. Uh, and, and then in 97, she died listening to the music of Von Deiru, uh, who you see in PBS quite a bit, and what music that she loved. So, so I mean, what's the point? Cognitive activities uh, uh, saved her sister, the perfectly normal brain. My mother didn't really practice that that much. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm busy working. I couldn't be there all day with her. And, uh, uh, and I even had some, some uh, maids helping. But I noticed they watched soap operas. They didn't ever get in the activities uh, with her, which I encouraged them to do. I gave them games, but they never really uh, did the work. And, uh, uh, and uh, then, the, then the other sister, I mean, it's a very interesting story, really demonstrates what I'm talking about. And uh, then the, the nun study, I think it was even Notre Dame nuns, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, some died uh, at age 100, they did autopsies, and they had horrible memory loss, found nothing. The other ones uh, who had horrible, uh, who, uh, the, and they had uh, uh, other ones uh, who had no memory loss at all. They did autopsy, found all kinds of amyloid bodies uh, and uh, neurofibrillary tangles. You see, no correlation, and no correlation, very interesting. Uh, you know, we spoke a little earlier already about short-term and long-term memory, and uh, uh, short-term memory is stored in the hippocampus. They removed the hippocampus from a patient years ago with HM by a neurosurgeon. Uh, he was doing it to get rid of her epilepsy, uh, totally knocked out her recent memory. But she uh, maintained quite a bit of, uh, he maintained quite a bit of long-term memory. So that's why we know where short-term memory is located. And uh, acetylcholine really is the uh, drug that is involved with our memory. And there's a place in the frontal lobe called the basalis minor nucleus. Uh, if you have an injury and that's affected, you're going to lose a lot of uh, memory. That's the reason they try acetylcholine, uh, cholinesterase inhibitors to, to keep them, the body from breaking acetylcholine apart. Uh, to get the level up to improve your memory, but the only done trouble, uh, Dr. Whitehouse feels the drugs do, uh, don't work, at, at most extremely little. And here's a brain that shows quite a few uh, 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 neuroreceptors. And, uh, and uh, what, how you develop brain reserve, the best way to keep from having dementia memory loss, you get older, is brain reserve. Education is helpful. Uh, educated people are less likely to get dementia because they're brain reserved. They have more neurotransmitters, more. Uh, more neurons, they make more synapses. So the trick is to make more synapses. We have at least 100 trillion synapses, but we can increase throughout their life, learning and activities and, and playing games and, and doing puzzles and Sudoku and playing sports. Remember, exercise is four times more important to the brain and the body. Exercise will cause us to grow synapses and, and causes uh, the manufacture of neurotrophic factors where neural cells are grown uh, and uh, uh, synapses and neurotransmitters are increased. And uh, there are more synapses than stars in the universe. They, they feel people who do puzzles every day have a 40% decrease in dementia. I'm not sure there's 100% proven, but, but uh, my experience with people I know that, do, that do, do them have excellent memories, excellent memories. And uh, I know that because anesthesiologists have a lot of free time. And what do they sit around in the doctor's lounge doing? They're all doing puzzles. <laughs> and I find extremely intelligent bunts. And uh, uh, much more than 
than the majority of the people that I talked to. So I formed the Memory Protection Plan, the, the Longevity Mind Body Index, LMBI. And uh, so let's go down the line of things that help your brain. Proper eating, remember I said that's number one. Two, exercising regularly to prevent memory loss. Number three, college education or education in general. Normal body mass index, normal waist measurement, adult education, very important. To have a purpose in life, don't retire. Bad habit, don't retire. And people who uh, retire early have cognitive decline many times, unless they find something else to do. Good sleep habits uh, is on the, uh, uh, clearly uh, on the list. Stress control steroids are destructive to the hippocampus and destroy the mind. So stress reduction is extremely important. I have good things on my website about stress reduction. I have the stress icon, the great, great things on there. Uh, yoga, meditation, Tai Chi, Qigong are very good uh, for the mind. Again, here you see a demonstration of the longevity mind-body index. And uh, work, don't retire. Have a purpose. I feel so lucky. I feel so lucky. And, uh, and I'm, you know, uh, been in this 41 years at age 39, but every day I get up, I have a purpose. I do a lot of teaching. I, I do full-time neurosurgery, play tennis, take uh, music lessons. I feel I have a purpose in life to bring wellness to the community. I feel so fortunate. I hope you have a purpose. Develop a purpose. I saw a patient today had no purpose. That's destructive. That's destructive. And he started having all sorts of imaginary symptoms. And I become a positive thinker. Read the books of Norman Vincent Peale. They're on my website. I treated uh, one of his assistants, and he came in. I can't believe it. He was so grateful I saved his wife. He brought in all the works of Norman Vincent Peale, all, autographed by him and his wife, Ruth, 21 books. I've read them three times. And, uh, and he wrote the great works of power of positive thinking. It's extremely important. Uh, play computer video games, brain gym activities. Uh, they sharpen your mind, no doubt about it. But not eight hours a day. I'm talking about 30 minutes, an hour a day at most. Keep a normal blood pressure, very important. Normal blood pressure, uh, hypertension destructive to the brain. It causes white matter changes and you lose some memory, no doubt about it. Have great hobbies, uh, plant a garden, uh, do woodwork, whatever. Uh, uh, read a book a week. Different books are even better. And do puzzles, play cards, reduce dementia 30 to 40 percent. Play music, take music lessons, go dancing. Genetics play a part, but not that huge. I mean, there is, there is some genetic aspects to Alzheimer's disease, and they've discovered a protein, let's call it dementia. Uh, but don't start living in the role. Because your sister had it doesn't mean you're going to get it. So start, don't start looking for things. Learn a new language. Learn a new word a day. There are websites for that. Wordsmith is a good website. The, 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 the names of those are on my website. And uh, uh, AARP has a wonderful uh, uh, free games on it located also. Learn a new word every day. Have a social circle, very important, uh, especially in these foreign countries that people live a long time, 100, 110. They have great social circles. We need that. Avoid head injuries. Head injuries cause amyloid bodies, nerve fibrillary tangles, and, and, and can uh, greatly affect uh, uh, your mentation and cause dementia at a young age. Avoid toxic habits. Smoking, alcohol, and drugs uh, are uh, destructive to the human brain. Uh, I see people 80 years old, they're on 15 medications, they get memory loss. What do you expect? Those drugs are going to interact. People in the 80s and 90s should not be all these medications. I try to stop them as much as I can. And, uh, some people are so drowsy, they fall out of wheelchairs. I saw it recently. I saw it recently. She fell out of, right out of wheelchairs. She's on 15 medications, 83 years old. One, she was on a narcotic. Give me a break. Give me a break. And uh, education, how, how does it work? It, you develop more neurons, more synapses, more neurotransmitters. That's, that's how it works. What are some good foods? To follow the, the secret of the non-diet, a book I, I wrote, which is uh, largely about uh, 80 percent vegan type diet. You eat some meat, but not a lot of it. It's kind of like Dr. Furman's high dense nutritarian type diets. See, the phytochemicals of foods with color have about 10,000 phytochemicals in them. They're very good for the brain. They're very good for the brain. They provide the necessary enzymes for the, for the brain. Uh, if you eat meat and fat every day, fat is destructive to the brain. Fat has 20 nasty enzymes in them that, that cause cancer, a dem uh, a dementia, heart disease, strokes, Get away from fatty foods. And uh, vitamin E is helpful. There's some debate about that, about folate, spinach, tomatoes, chickpeas, beans, soybeans, beets, whole grain foods, green leafy vegetables, sweet potatoes, avocados. They are good for the brain. So eating a proper diet is quite important. Plus, it gets your dental health in excellent control, your weight in excellent control, and you'll have a sound mind. Remember, I want you to be 100 and have a sound mind. Let's not forget that. 
He had, looked like he had a lot of neurotransmitters here and uh, foods for better memories, antioxidants, blueberries, uh, pomegranates, carrots. Uh, see this, what is, why does our brain age? They think it's a free radical theory of aging. What this is, uh, for, uh, is that during metabolism, after all we need some energy, uh, that uh, sugar combining with oxygen uh, develops a lot of free radicals, and these free radicals attack our brain cells and we get memory loss. So eating too much food, for example, you have too many free radicals. That's the free radical theory of aging, uh, which is probably the best uh, theory of it. And uh, protect your brain from injury, poor co cognition, boxing and playing soccer. You take your kid having, getting hit in the head with a soccer ball all day, I can't imagine it's very good to his brain. That brain is a three pound piece of fat. And uh, can you imagine what happens to it when you get hit by a ball? So I'm not too anxious about that. And boxing, of course, is destructive to the brain. We know many famous people that have had uh, memory loss, dementia, uh, from being boxers. It tears your long axons of your body, interferes with your neurotransmitters and nerves. Uh, you have decreased neurotransmitters, smaller brain reserve, and you're going to get dementia as you get older. And uh, you increase in amyloid and nerve fibrillary tangles. Here's somebody with a lot of good neurotransmitters. Uh, so exercise increases your memory, decreases advanced dementia. BDNF is brain-derived neurotrophic factor, increases with exercise, build more neurons, neurotransmitters, and you, get, you become more intelligent. Socialization is helpful. Don't retire. Uh, in, in the aging brain, uh, what we need is increased speed of tra uh, transmission of information. It slows down a bit. The speed of our transmission through our nerves slows down, but you can increase it by using computer training games, including video games, Art increases abstract thinking, puzzles, Sudoku cards. Uh, so I look at my website, Dr. Wellner's uh, Brain Gym on Cash from Mind Body. Uh, there's a zillion things on there to improve uh, your brain. Uh, go to church, volunteer, go dancing, take lessons, join the Y, work out regularly. Uh, I've donated some money uh, to the new Y in, uh, because I, I think it's very important. Uh, people uh, like going there. The socialization and the exercise very important. Plant a garden and eat the food. Eat whole food right out of the ground. Very healthy. Take cooking lessons. Take your children and teach them cooking lessons. Teach your children how to shop. Uh, go to theater and concerts. Uh, music, uh, the Mozart effect can grow the brain. Develop a rich social network. Isol isolation is a killer. Isolation is a killer. Chronic stress and depression are toxic to memory. Uh, dementia can be difficult to diagnose. You may, it may present as loss of energy and appetite, loss of self-esteem, isolation. Uh, uh, people with memory loss start exercising, and then you tell them uh, you have dementia and, uh, and you're going to get Alzheimer's disease, have a nice day. That's destructive. It's depressive. Uh, it'll certainly happen. Would you predict it's going to happen? So depression causes memory loss. Light stress increases memory, actually, but depression increases uh, memory loss uh, Steroids, cortisol is destructive uh, to the hippocampus and causes memory loss. What are some memory tricks? Look, snap, and connect. I'll forget some names now and then. You know why I forget them? I never heard them in the first place. Don't pay any attention. So pay attention uh, to, what, to what you're doing. Uh, you, you know, people, as years go by, people complain of losing their keys and, and losing their cell phone. Well, you know what the trouble is most of the time? They're, they're multitasking. They're paying no attention to where they put them in the first place. Multitasking uh, and, and texting is very dangerous. I, the other day, went to a fast food restaurant, have a cup of coffee. I don't eat their food, and uh, I don't eat the salt, uh, salt and sugar to, to slow down my brain cells. And uh, I walked out, looked right, saw nobody, looked left, no somebody, and I looked a little, and I walked straight ahead. My God, if there's a teenager zipping through the parking lot uh, and uh, uh, texting, not even looking up, almost killed me. Almost killed me. Multitasking, very dangerous, very uh, uh, dangerous. Take notes, post-it notes. They help to remind us about things. If you, these memory experts, you know what they do? I mean, they did memory contests. What they do is when they're looking at different names and numbers they're trying to memorize, they visualize it. They put a vis visualization with that number or they put some emotion to it. That's how I remember something better. Put an emotion to it, repeat it, or visualize it is a way to improve your uh, memory. For example, recently, uh, I was in uh, Naples, Florida. I was playing tennis, and a guy walks out, and he says, my name is Philippe de Montebello. I mean, what a name to remember. I mean, how would you ever remember a name, name like that? Well, I asked him what he did for a living. He said he'd been the CEO of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York for 30 years. I mean, just think of it. That was three blocks from my house where I lived in New York City. 
But look at the people he's met, kings and queens and all the art and traveling everywhere. What an individual. I attached a lot of emotion to this story, so I'm able to recall this difficult name uh, quite uh, uh, rapidly. Emotions are extremely uh, important. Incidentally, I beat him two and two, and he didn't like it. <laughs> and a very famous individual. He has a great book out, too. Look at him. I, I really like that guy. Uh, so visualize, very helpful. Good night's sleep. Your memory's better if you wake in the morning. You see all this increased neurotransmitter. That person had a good night's sleep. Read my book, The Secrets of the, of the Non-Diet, uh, which is really a way of eating. I don't recommend a diet. It's a way of eating. Vegetarian, vegan, then I have flexitarian, 80% vegan, and, and then Dr. Furman's high-dense nutritarian way of eating. Uh, you'll, you'll have a normal BMI. You'll live a long life. You'll have an excellent memory. I think it's a good book to read. And uh, I can reverse type 2 diabetes in 60 days, and I'm writing a book on it. I, and I, just like I found Dr. Whitehouse's book, I found another book that confirmed what I'm doing. So I know I'm correct about this, but type 2 diabetes, is, which is rampant in this country, doubling every 10 years, has dementia attached to it in many cases because fat makes the cells sticky and oxygen can't get in. It's destructive to the, uh, to the cells. Uh, and if you can get rid of type 2 diabetes, please, do, if you have it, get rid of it. 90% chance I can get rid of it for you. In, in 60 days. I'm writing a book on it. It'll be, done, it'll be done shortly. I'm backed up by Dr. Franklin House's book. He came out again. God dropped it at me at Barnes and Noble. Uh, and uh, and uh, he says he can reverse it in 30 days. And on page 78 of his book, The Diet He Recommends, is exactly what I teach in my eating classes at the Lufan Hospital. I know I'm right. He backs it up. 30 years he's been doing this. So I'm very confident in what I say. And since there's so many people with type 2 diabetes, I beg you, I beg you to do something about it. Most of it is strictly involved with being overweight or obese. You get to a normal BMI, 90% chance, this horrible monkey on your back will be gone. You'll avoid dementia, strokes, heart attacks, live to be 100 of good mind. Please, I beg you to do something about it. And uh, Because I love you, that's why. And, uh, so uh, type 2 diabetes, matter of fact, they've gotten to the point that, that they call uh, Alzheimer's disease, or let's say advanced dementia, a new term you want to use, or you want to, I'd like to know a friendlier term. If you got one, please give it to me. They call it diabetes type 3. Yes, diabetes type 3, because it's so often found with diabetics. Food to avoid, avoid fat, salt, and sugar. Fast food restaurants, most restaurants are made from f- fat, salt, and sugar. They just move it around, call it different names, uh, and, uh, uh, and that is really uh, what causes you to be overweight. Obesity leads to a cognitive impairment, okay? Incidentally, we're talking about psychology and eating. Food's a drug. Food's a drug. The average person thinks about what to eat 200 times a day. Remember that. I just read that in the book, Mindless Eating. 200 times a day, we think about what we're going to eat. Wow. That's a little bit scary. And uh, eat a lot of fish, lots of omega-3. Alcohol is toxic to the brain at all times. Let's say I have a glass of wine every day. It's okay. Huh. It destroys brain cells. You just grow more than it destroys. So in, in essence, I mean, it's not that unfriendly. Uh, but it still, it's a neurotoxin. And one glass a day may lead to two glasses a day. Before you know it, you're both drinking. Watch out. Alcohol is a neurotoxin. Improving your working memory, the working around you to your everyday activities, what can you do? Remember multitasking and how dangerous it is, uh, and texting how dangerous that is. And uh, uh, there are different things that you can do to improve your working memory. And for an example, uh, uh, you can do, memorize uh, words. Uh, you can go to my website. There's a zillion games uh, you can play. But here's an interesting one, like your phone number. Why do they have it in, in threes and fours? Because you can memorize a lot easier. At the hospital, the medical record number, and I do dictate all day long, is six digits long. Now, I used to put it in three digits, chunk it into three digits, and then the other three, and you can uh, remember to do your dictation. But lately, to improve my memory, I can look at it for two seconds, and I remember all six numbers. Now, I've been doing it for about a year now, and in, 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 in I'm moving up to eight numbers. So practice uh, that does indeed help. It, it improves your memory and, and, and intelligence. And uh, try to memorize 10 digits at a time. And uh, uh, break numbers into groups, that's something called chunking. 
So let's build a super prior brain, education. Remember what I said about that? Read, education, go, go back to college. And uh, attention to sensory expression using your five senses. Memorize poetry. Uh, attach emotions to your important memories. You have important memories, put an emotion to it. You're much more likely to remember it. Or repeat it. Remember, I said repetition. And, and for Pete's sake, if you're trying to remember something like a name, you've got to listen to it in the first place. You've got to listen to it. Then snap it to something and, and then connect it to some story, a visualization. And you're much more likely to uh, remember it. And, uh, but use visualizations, which is the language of the unconscious mind, uh, to improve your memory. Uh, and encoded uh, in your brain. And uh, read and write, write books. And uh, believe it or not, I'm writing four books at the same time. I can't believe I do it, but it's improving my memory. Take music lessons, which I uh, have done on the uh, saxophone. Improve your fluid intelligence, learn new knowledge. Increase your crystallized intelligence based on old knowledge. So increase your curi curiosity that improves your brain. Use memory pegs, techniques of improving your memory. Uh, repeat it and deliberately practice it. Uh, to improve your memory throughout your life, you got to work at it. You've got to work at it. That's very important. Uh, use Pogo on my website. Uh, Pogo has so many free things on it, uh, I, I can't be, uh, believe it. You improve your memory tremendously. Use it 30 minutes a day, but there are many other websites uh, on it. So really, in summary, uh, what have I been talking about here? I've I'm, I'm been talking about memory and to maintain our memory. Uh, I personally think we need to develop uh, another way of speaking about demen dementia. I think we need a different term. Alzheimer's disease is not an entity that has been proven, and to destroy people with the name and the words, I, I, I think this, this needs to be stopped. We need to redefine in our society how we uh, deal with people who are aging. We cannot just, because you're missing a few words, throw you in a nursing home and then um, in the dementia unit one and the number two and number three in, in the gulags. We need to redefine it. It's never been proven that Alzheimer's disease is a distinct disease entity. I completely agree with Dr. Whitehouse. I have this book to back me up in my opinion. I'm ready for a debate on it. Anybody wants to take me on it, I'd be gladly <laughs> take you up on it. Uh, and uh, because I'm just searching for knowledge, but I like to be open-minded about it and maybe maybe read his book. I'm writing a book about too. My, the name of mine is a little more unfriendly. I'm going to call mine the fraud of Alzheimer's disease, just to bring the subject out on the table and and looking, uh, frankly, for the uh, for the truth. I really appreciate uh, you listening to me. Uh, and I, I, I try to teach this in, in my wellness studio, frankly, because I love you. And I hope you uh, visit uh, my Wellness Institute, read my books, and look at my DVDs. Thank you so much for your attention.